I'm letting people in. Thank you. Hello and welcome everyone to the Garden Hour with a new extension. My name is Debbie Kelly. I'm a horticulture specialist in Jefferson County and that's located just south of St. Louis. As always, we're happy to have you here. It's a gorgeous, beautiful day, at least where I am in my part of the state. The sun is shining and the sky is blue. And I'll tell you what, there's lots of things that are just leafing out, budding out, flowering out. My lilacs are smelling wonderful. So we're excited to visit with you today and to answer your questions. As you all know, uh, each week I show you this map and we can always come back to it so you know who your horticulture person is across the state. And if by chance that person isn't listed, it's an open position, you're more than welcome to contact any one of us just simply because we're happy to answer our questions. We love what we do. What I'd like to do is let you know that Druba has changed his name to ask questions here. So if you've got a question that you would like to ask of the presenter or a question that we haven't answered that's new to you and you would like to have it answered, go ahead and drop that into the chat box to ask questions here. And go ahead and put in your email address for Druba as well. Only Druba will see that. And then we'll try to answer those questions if at a later time after today if we're not able to get to your question live. But we're happy to have you. And what I'm gonna do is go ahead and get us started and turn it over to uh, Tony Lupa with our weather report. So Tony, it's all yours. Tony, are you there? I'm not hearing you talk if you're, if you're, I see your presentation, but I don't hear you talking. Hello, hello. can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Thank you, Tony. Okay. And my presentation's showing? Yes. Okay. For some reason, I'm hitting on my Zoom and I'm getting teams to come up. So, so I don't know what's happening if I'm hitting the button wrong or what, but let's go on with the forecast because I think I can go now. And if we look at the temperatures yesterday, yesterday was a pretty good day across the state. There were some areas that got a little bit of shower activity, especially uh, to the north. And uh, yesterday was mostly in the 60s to near 70 in some locations. Uh, and this is a little bit below normal. You can see across much of the Midwest to our north and east, and even over much of Missouri, below normal temperatures. The only places that were close to normal is this little area to the near Boone County and to our north and west, but uh, the majority of the state was below normal. And why is that? Well, we've got high pressure in control right now. You can see that uh, high pressure is keeping us under mainly sunny skies. Uh, some of you at, in near the Boot Heel and near Springfield and Joplin may be seeing clouds associated with some of this rain that will move along our southern tier of states, but unfortunately not make its, our way, its way up to here, at least not very quickly. Uh, the dew points are correspondingly low as well, and that's, that's a good thing if you want to get outside, not so good if we want rain. We're caught, uh, I, I talked about this last week and the, uh, the, this uh, phenomenon called blocking did materialize. Not only did it materialize, but we're kind of caught in a vice. We're caught between two of them. And blocking is just a persistent ridge in the jet stream. And these things will last anywhere from three to 35 days an average of 10 days. 
But when they team up like this in the Pacific and the Atlantic, that leaves us in the middle of the country underneath a trough, and a trough usually means cold weather. So this is the situation as of Sunday morning, and this is this morning. You can see we're still caught in that vice. And again, you don't hear a lot about blocking from meteorologists because they occur out over the oceans typically, and they're very rare over North America. You maybe see them once every two to three years, but they do impact our weather substantially like they are now. Let's look at precip in the last 30 days. Precipitation has uh, fallen across the southern part of Missouri. As you can see, it's kind of slowing down from what it has the past few weeks. And in a many places in the state for April, we're running a little bit below normal. Anywhere from a little bit below normal to a lot below normal, as I'll show. Um, again, the seasonal projection was that we would see above normal precipitation, especially in the south and east. And in March, that was certainly the case. Uh, drought conditions, what's happening? We're getting this little extension of drought here across from about uh, north of Springfield through Boone County and just to our north and east. Just a little bit of what we call stage one drought or um, uh, moderate drought, but across the state, pretty much uh, no drought conditions. And what's been going on? Last week I was reporting here, last week I was reporting here that we were well above normal for April. Most places were three and four degrees above normal, but the pattern made a switch on us shortly after my talk last week when I talked about the possibility of this blocking coming on. And you can see that it's brought April back to a position where it's closer to normal now. So we were way above normal. We've been knocked down to near normal. And you can see that with precipitation, we're running way below normal in central Missouri. Other parts of Missouri is below normal. But these, uh, these below normal precipitation values were offset by, um, by above normal marches. So there's other parts of the state that aren't as dire as we are here in central Missouri. Central Missouri seems to be getting picked on lately with uh, dry conditions. And again, the big change, last week I showed you this big ridge over the uh, continental United States with troughs off of our coast. That has flipped 180 degrees. We'd have these blocking events for the late April period dominating the East Pacific and the West Atlantic, keeping us in that vice. And of course, being in that vice those areas have been above normal with their pressures and temperatures. We have been below normal. So uh, when, when you have that kind of a setup, it's always below normal. The uh, pros at NSEP say for the next one to seven days, you might get some good precip across the uh, southern tier of state of counties in our state but that areas to the north are gonna remain dry. So uh, we continue to think that this blocking pattern is gonna keep us in cool, dry conditions for most of the state. A six to 10 day outlook is consistent with what I just said, way below normal for most of the East Coast and below normal precipitation, dry conditions. Uh, 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 persisting for much, much of the uh, central United States. 
And even if we look out three weeks, you remember last week I showed the three to four week outlook with below normal temperatures over the northern tier of states. We're keeping that, uh, that situation right through mid-May. So I'm not liking what I'm seeing <laughs> in terms of temperature and even the dryness of the upper Midwest. Uh, not liking that either because April and May are supposed to be our wettest periods. So if we don't get that precipitation now, we could be in trouble later this summer, uh, contrary to what we were thinking earlier this season. But uh, again, in this equal chances part, we're not sure. So I'm hoping that uh, we do get some precipitation in the next few weeks. What's our forecast look like? All right, this afternoon and right through Friday, increasing clouds mainly. Uh, temperatures in the low 60s north of here, north of 70 to upper 60s, south of I-70 and in the I-70 corridor. Tonight will be anywhere from 40 in the north to around 50 in the south. I'm expecting the winds to pick up a little bit as we get more clouds to come in. There's some of you in the southern part of the state, again, may be under clouds already, but we'll see that spread to the northern parts of the state and even showers spread into the Columbia region by morning and then in the afternoon uh, up into the uh, northern part of the state. But again, I expect all of this precipitation to be very light, unfortunately. Uh, Thursday, very cool underneath these clouds, low 60s across the state. That's well below normal. Uh, Friday, upper 60s to near 70s when we get some peaks of sunshine and lows in the mid to upper 40s Thursday night and Friday night, but near 50 in the south. Saturday and Sunday, Saturday will begin cloudy with some light showers across the state. And then you'll be clearing uh, during the afternoon right through Sunday night. Saturday will be mid 60s to upper 60s across the state from north to south. And Sunday in the upper 50s to mid 60s. So a little bit of cool on Sunday. And Saturday night low to mid 40s, but Sunday night in the mid 30s north but low 40s elsewhere. So if you're in the upper tier of states, say above Route 36, you might see some scattered frost yet again. Monday and Tuesday, sunny and cool. Like I said, we're gonna continue that until that blocking pattern breaks. Mid 60s on Monday, mid to upper 60s uh, Tuesday and lows in the upper 30s north on Monday night to around 40 elsewhere, and then the low to mid 40s Tuesday night. So again, we're gonna continue with this unseasonably cool weather. Any questions? I don't think anything has come in. Uh, we just wanna say thank you a whole lot, Tony. We appreciate you being here every week with us and providing the forecast to get us set and ready to go with all of our questions. We've had quite a few questions coming in and we're really happy to have those questions. They help us to help you to make your garden and your lawn and your landscape a lot better. What I'm gonna do is turn it over to Jennifer and she's gonna be our moderator for today. So Jennifer, let's get started. Thank you, Debbie, and good afternoon, everyone. Our first question is a fruit question and it reads, I just noticed all my elderberry plants have an infestation of tiny little black bugs covering the limbs. I'm not sure how to get rid of them safely. I don't usually spray for pests. I would like to use organic if possible. And uh, Tamara, would you like to answer this question, please? Yes, I would. All right, so um, you can see my screen, right? Yes. Great, okay. So. Um, the question came in that they have tiny little black bugs and they are found on the on the limbs of elderberry. Um, they 
I, so some questions I have um, and, and that they have, because I reached out to this, this individual, they were asking, are these elder, are, are these black bugs going to be hurting the plant? Um, and what are the control strategies? So I'm going to walk you through how, how we made the decisions and, and um, came up with control strategies. So these are actually aphids. Um, going back, you can't, it's hard to see. They are very, very small. But um, when we look at them up close, we find that they are aphids. I put this um, one up here because it's a lot easier to see what we're looking at because aphids are small. They're usually about an eighth of an inch or less. They are soft bodied, pear shaped. They have long legs and antennae. Their color can be many different colors. They can be green, yellow, black, red, uh, gray. There's a lot of different colors. They usually have a or they could have a pair of transparent wings, um, but during the summer, usually they don't. Um, so one, the characteristic that we're usually looking for is actually these cornicles right here when, um, when, we're, when we're identifying them. And you've probably seen me put this up here, so I'm just going to walk you through what, what it is that we, what we look for um, in taking care of any sort of a pest. Um, so the first thing is identifying, which was the question that she asked, what is this insect? So that's great. And then how do we control it? So the next thing that we need to think about is, do we actually need to control it? Uh, you've probably seen me bring this up here. This is just a graph that talks about the population density as the population goes up over time. Where are we on here? Is it actually causing a problem for, for the, uh, for the plant? Um, is it going to cause distress? Is it going to cause disease? Um, and, and what is the population when it starts causing problems? Um, one of those ways is you can look at the plant. Some plants actually can get diseases. So all of those things go through our heads um, when we're looking at, at this. In this case, the elderberry is not under distress, but it could potentially be. That population has exploded. Um, the aphids, uh, during uh, during this time, they um, they are uh, feeding on the new growth. Um, in this case, they're actually able to be on on the on the stems of the plant. Um, but the population can explode because a lot of them are they're they're reproducting parthenogenically, meaning that it's just females um, having females, and they can even be born pregnant. So you can actually have a population explosion. So now that we know what it is, we know that the plant um, at this point is okay, but um, but we don't want it to get worse. So we can look at prevention and action strategies. This plant and pest they're already established, so there's not a lot of the uh, not lot sorry not a lot that we can do to prevent this pest at this stage. But it is good to mention because this is the time of year when people are purchasing plants. So please inspect your plants before purchasing. This is an example of a plant that I picked up at a store uh, and I flipped it over and looked and sure enough, there were aphids underneath. So make sure you always check your plants before you bring them home. You might already have aphids near your home, but bringing home plants with pests on them could actually introduce new varieties or new species, um, even new viruses that they could have or, or pests that are resistant to pesticides. So always check your plants before you purchase new ones. So back to this. Um, since this is an elderberry, most, if any of these aphids are not going to have wings, a forceful stream of water to dislodge the aphids is practical. Most aphids will not be able to return to the plant after this treatment, and the water will also remove any recently deposited honeydew from, from the aphids. So you can do this as often as needed. Um, you also could prune the aphid infested new growth. Uh, sometimes those, um, the populations get so high and they're they're um, harder to see because there's a lot of growth. And so opening up the plant can actually make it so that the habitat is less suitable for, for these kinds of, of pests. Um, also, uh, reinforcements are already on their way for this. Uh, when I talked to the client, uh, she mentioned that she had already seen a ladybug and that's that's what's going to happen. You're going to start seeing ladybugs coming. There's also going to be parasitoid wasps that come um, to parasitize the, the aphids. Um, you're also going to end up with lace wings that, that are going to come to eat. So that's that's um, what would how we walk through this chart. Uh, these I want you to note that these suggestions for aphids in home situations would be similar for many different plants. It might be necessary to use something like an insecticidal soap, uh, but be sure to make 
sure that you use good technique, spray under the leaves. Um, commercial growers are probably going to have different strategies, um, but a lot of these things are going to be the same. So that was the recommendation for this plant this time. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Tamara. Our next question is regarding growing potatoes in buckets. And can you do that? Does it work? And I'm going to address that question. All right, so the answer is yes. You can grow potatoes in buckets or big livestock mineral tubs and other containers. You wanna make sure that you have holes drilled in the bottom of the container. Never plant anything in a container without first putting the, the holes in there for good drainage. With potatoes, you can plant them in March or April. If you live in way Southern Missouri, you can probably plant them in March. Some people will plant them around St. Patrick's Day. But if you live in Northern Missouri, which we call Kirksville, the ice box of Missouri, you probably aren't gonna plant them in March because our soil is cold and it is usually wet. So in Northern Missouri, we plant them in April. Usually the first or second week of April is ideal in this part of the state. And when planting seed potatoes, you wanna space them about six inches <clears throat> excuse me, six inches apart. You want to plant three to four in a large container like a livestock mineral tub, but in a five gallon bucket, you would only want to put one seed potato. And these photos here uh, illustrate how you should space them and shows you that the plants are coming up. And I have done this. These red containers you see are from several years ago that I planted, I have grown red potatoes, like red Pontiac, red Norlin. I've also grown Kennebec, which is a white potato. And I've grown the purple or blue potatoes in containers. So they do work and they are productive. But again, the question was regarding a bucket. So in a five gallon bucket, you only want probably one seed potato. Regarding sweet potatoes, these are warm season crops and they need to be planted after the danger of frost has passed. So this is going to be around May 10th in Northern Missouri, maybe the first part of May in Southern Missouri. And you only wanna put one sweet potato plant per container. So here you see a livestock mineral tub. This was in my garden a year ago and I only put one sweet potato in, in any container that I'm using. I started using containers several years ago with sweet potatoes because we were having issues growing sweet potatoes in the ground. Something was eating them out, like hollowing them out and just leaving the outer shell. So I started putting them in uh, containers and they have done wonderful. So they, they have produced well, they produce large potatoes and I harvest them in September and early October. And then here's uh, some photos showing you how big they can get in a container. So they can get you know, almost football size. So pr pretty nice. And they produce a lot. So back to uh, even red and white potatoes, they are productive. You know, just all potatoes grown in containers uh, do well. Uh, keep them watered when we are going through a, a dry spell if you're just relying on the rain. And uh, good luck to everyone who is growing potatoes and containers. All right, our next question. Jennifer. Yes. There was a question that came in. Drew, do you want to ask that, please? Yes. Uh, so I was I was also doing the same thing. So Jennifer, we have a we have questions about potato. So in the chat box, the question is how long, like uh, how many days after planting would we see sprouting in Kansas City area in a container? Yeah, I okay, so containers, whenever you plant anything in a container, um, it usually comes up pretty quick because the, and this is the reason for using containers often in the springtime, the soil warms faster. And usually on a potato, I see germination of them within about two weeks. Now it does, that takes a little longer than let's say spinach or lettuce or radishes, because you should see um, germination on them within about a week. But with the potatoes, because you're planted them, you know, a little bit deeper than you would seeds, you're going to plant them, you know, four or six inches down in that container. 
it's going to be two weeks at least, maybe three, but usually by the third week after planting, I am getting growth uh, in container grown potatoes. Is that all, Druba? Okay, we'll move on so, to our next question. Yeah, so Jennifer, sorry. So I was I was muted when I was talking. So I also received one more question for Tony. Is is Tony still here about the weather? I think he's muted. It, it looks like he is on. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes. What was what's the question? Okay. So we have a questions about weather. Somebody asked. So do these temperatures mean that the more uh, more ill or more more season will be extended? So that is the question about the temperature on your presentation. Will the will the morel season be extended? Mm -hmm. Um. Well, <laughs> I I have no expertise in morel mushrooms and their season, so I I don't have a good answer for that. I just know that the temperatures are going to remain cool for a while, and I think then uh, if 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 they like cool weather then yeah they should be extended but uh, uh but but again i'm not a morel mushroom guy so i don't i don't uh, have a lot of good guidance on on that so yeah so tamra has uh put a link on the chat box about uh, about morel hunting yeah so you can look on that thank you all right, I'm not a morale expert, but my boys have been mushroom hunting here in the last uh, week or so. And I know that they always want the cooler weather, you know, anywhere from 60 to 70 degrees. They don't want 80 degree temperatures. So we like it cooler, not cold. And then rain also helps so that it seems to extend our season up here if it stays between 60 to 70 and we've had some rain showers. All right, yeah, moving on to our, our next question. Can hydrangea bushes be moved now? And do they prefer full sun or partial shade? And Debbie is going to answer that question. Yeah, so the, the question came in. So I, I looked at this up because I wasn't exactly sure what the answer is. And a lot of times we don't always know what the answers are. and We have to look that up. And that's one of the reasons why I think we love our job is because we're always learning something new. So I appreciate the question that came in. So I'm going to talk about transplanting and propagating hydrangeas. So can you transplant them? The answer is yes. Um, they have an active growth period between March and September. So during that time frame is not the ideal time to re-transplant, to dig up an entire bush and to move it to a new location. Um, usually you want to do that transplanting either in very early spring or very late in the fall when the plant is not actively growing. That is going to be the best time to transplant that particular uh, bush for you so that you don't do damage because when you do a transplant, the, the plant becomes under stress and it could take longer for that plant to adapt and to adjust and to acclimate to that new location. So you just wanna be careful when it comes to transplanting. But let's talk about propagating because propagating is something that's probably a lot easier to do if your bush is a larger bush. So you can do what is called layering. Layering is where you kind of dig a little bit of a trench next to the bush. And then one of the larger branches that are, are that you can actually bend down without breaking. You can bend that down to the trench line that you've created. You wanna remove about a one inch ring around that branch all the way around it, just cutting into it slightly without hurting too much of that because you're making a layer there where the um, plant will actually, once it's buried under that, that trench with about six to 12 inches of the, the top of that branch sticking up out of that trench, then um, it will develop new roots where that small ring is that goes around. And once it's rooted really well, you can go ahead and totally cut it off 
from the mother bush. And then you can take that smaller one that's rooted and go ahead and transplant that to a new location. So a lot of our, our soft, our long stemmed um, bushes that are easy to bend without breaking, we can do this layering and create new plants of our own from those that are already existing. So you don't always have to go buy a new bush or a new plant, we can do layering. You can also do division uh, with the hydrangeas. And this is really, again, before they actually start to, to leaf out when they're still in dormancy in very early spring. And you can actually take a shovel and actually divide the clump that is there. Um, I know I've done that with some ornamental grasses that my mom had at her house that I simply had to have at my house. And when the plant is dormant is when you would actually do this and then transplant that to your new location. Softwood cuttings is something that can actually be done with the hydrangeas. You can actually do those during the summer time frame. You want to select the terminal cuttings from non-flowering shoots. So not every new shoot is going to have a flower on it. If it doesn't have a flower, that's what you want to use. The terminal cutting is going to be at the tip, the terminal, the end. So you want to go ahead from the end of that non-blooming branch, go down about three to five inches. And if you want, you might go just a little bit longer, four, five, six inches in length and go ahead and cut that off. You want to make sure that you would leave at least three leaves on that stem. When you make the cut, you want to cut it at the node. A node is where the leaves actually attach to the branch. So cut it above a node and cut it on a slight angle. The reason for the angle is that you're having more surface area at that cut where there could be more roots that could be growing. Whereas if you cut it straight across, there's less area surface there for roots to grow. You want to go ahead and take that end cut and stick it into a rooting hormone and then place it in some moist growing media. Some people will actually take those three leaves that are left and cut half of those leaves off of each of those three leaves. And that helps to reduce the water loss, the dehydration, the wilting, because there is no actual roots at that particular point in time. Um, you want to keep it in a shaded area while it's rooting. You can do this in the ground or you can do it in a pot. Uh, but take sure if it's in a pot, make sure that it stays moist, not wet, but keep it moist because we want to make sure that that cutting is actually going to grab hold and develop some of those roots. And so that's what you can do if you're looking at trying to move a hydrangea or to actually uh, transplant are to propagate hydrangeas that are in your yard that you would like to spread to other locations and add more color to your landscape. Jeruba, do we have any questions regarding that topic? Yeah, so, yeah, so we had a question, does layering work on grapevines, but Tamara already, already answered on the chat box. So we are good to go, Jennifer. Okay. So this time of the year, we are getting a lot of soil test reports in, and some of you may have questions about reading your soil test report. And Druba is going to talk about soil test interpretation. All right, can you see my screen? Not the full screen, right? I can. Can you put that in reading view though? Give me a second. Okay, can you see now? Yes, I can. Looks good. All right. Thank you. All right. So uh, we uh, we receive questions and phone calls in our office about uh, about the interpreting soil test reports from many gardeners and growers. So this time of the year, and that's why we decided to talk briefly about soil test report interpretation in this garden hour. So after we receive soil sample in MU extension centers. We send these samples to MU soil and plant testing lab. Then we receive the soil test reports from the lab uh, about a week after they receive the soil sample in the lab. So uh, for this presentation, I have used a soil test report uh, for uh, azalea and perennial bedding plants, just uh, as an example 
uh, in this slide. So in the, in the test report, uh, we are provided mainly two different tables here. So the first table is about the soil test results. In this table, we can see the soil test results as an, uh, as an actual value uh, on, the, uh, on the left-hand side. And uh, we see uh, uh, other, other column, other big column as a rating as a relative nutrient and pH value. So we also see uh, another, another table. Uh, so that has provided with the fertilizer and limestone recommendation for the listed crops. So uh, let's look on the first table. So on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the first column of the first table, we see the soil test, uh, soil test parameters such as soil pH, soil phosphorus, potassium, uh, calcium, magnesium, and organic matter. And in the, in the second column uh, under the soil test results, we see the value of these parameters. So in the third column, we see the ratings of these parameters, whether they are very low or they are low or medium or high, very high or in excess. So let's look on the soil pH. The soil pH is 6.7, uh, which is in uh, optimum soil pH range for most of our crops, but uh, uh, it is not good for few uh, acid loving crops. So in, uh, so uh, in general case, we do not need to put lime or sulfur in the soil. Uh, remember, if our soil is acidic, we need to apply lime to raise soil pH. And if our soil pH is alkaline, we need to apply gypsum or elemental sulfur to lower down the soil pH. So this producer wants to plant azalea shrub uh, in the soil. And uh, this is a strong acid loving crop and the optimum soil pH to grow this crop like uh, azalea or blueberry or, or rhododendron is, uh, is about five to five and five. That's why for this soil, the lab, uh, the soil testing lab has, rec uh, has recommended to apply uh, 31 pounds of sulfur here, uh, of the elemental sulfur for 1000 square feet of, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the garden. So let's look on other, uh, other nutrients in this table. Uh, the soil phosphorus is 237 pounds per acre, which is, uh, uh, which is very high. And the potassium is 231 pounds per acre, which is uh, medium. And the calcium and magnesium are also rated high in the soil. Uh, if we look on the organic matter content, it is very, very high. So it is 18.2%. Uh, so if the soil has about four to 6% of the organic matter, that is good for our most of the crops. And uh, if we look at the value, the cation exchange capacity of the soil is 19.3, uh, which indicates the soil has good nutrient holding capacity. So let's look on the second table here for the fertilizer and limestone recommendation. Uh, uh, so uh, these value are given for the 1,000 square feet of the area of of uh, uh, of the of the garden. So uh, so the listed crop in this soil test report is uh, is uh, azalea. And, uh, as I already mentioned, that this is a strong acid loving crop. So for this crop, uh, we don't need to apply any nitrogen fertilizer, as this required nitrogen uh, for this plant is mineralized from the organic matter in the soil. And uh, in this soil, the organic matter content is very high, which is uh, more than uh, more than eighteen percent. So we also we also don't need to apply any uh, any phosphorus and uh, any uh, any phosphorus fertilizer because the phosphorus in soil is already uh, already very high. And the potassium fertilizer we need to apply about a half pound of potassium per one thousand square feet uh, of the area. And as I, uh, I already mentioned that uh, uh, this crop, azalea is a strong acid loving crop. And to grow uh, it better, we need to convert our soil to the acidic. So uh, around five to 5.5. So for this, we need to apply 31 pounds of elemental sulfur. Uh, so when we apply sulfur in our soil, uh, we need to be careful, so it should be uh, applied at least six months before planting crop so that it will react with the soil 
and the soil pH will be changed. If we plant our crop right after application of sulfur, it will be hot and uh, it might kill our plants. So let's go to the second slide. So I have I have taken uh, another soil test report, and uh, so uh, this soil test uh, uh, was for the lawn. So the soil test report uh, format is similar with the previous report. So uh, in this report, the soil pH is only 4.6. So this means the soil is highly highly acidic soil. In this soil, we need to uh, apply 220 five pounds lime per 1,000 square feet. So you can see here under the lime, uh, which is a very big amount for uh, 1,000 square feet. Uh, although it is recommended in very big amount of lime, we should apply only 50 pounds of limestone per 1,000 square feet in, in one application to the lawn. So uh, we can apply the second, uh, second application after six months to one year of the uh, first uh, first time application. The phosphorus content is only 98 pounds per acre. Uh, oh, uh, uh, it is the 98 pounds. So uh, I said uh, I said it is only, uh, yeah, so it is also high. So we don't need to apply any phosphorus fertilizer in this lawn either for the establishment or for maintenance. The potassium value of the soil is 241 pounds. Uh, uh, per acre and uh, which is in the medium range. So we need to apply half pound of potassium fertilizer for 1000 square feet of lawn uh, in the soil. Uh, the calcium is low and magnesium is medium in the soil. Uh, if we look on the organic matter content, it is 4% in the soil, which is in good range for the lawn. And that's why we don't need to apply any nitrogen fertilizer for this lawn if it is, uh, if it is just for the establishment of the lawn. So, however, uh, if we uh, if the lawn is for the maintenance, uh, we need to apply about three pounds of nitrogen per one thousand uh, uh, square foot, uh, uh, one thousand square feet of lawn. So, when we apply the nitrogen fertilizer, we need to split uh, into three uh, three different timings. So, uh, uh, we need to apply the first application in the spring, sometime in May. Uh, then in the second, in the fall, sometime in early September, and again, uh, the third one sometime in early November. So let's look uh, one more slide for the soil test report. So uh, this one is for the vegetable garden. Uh, we can see the soil pH is seven. Oh, yeah, so this one is for the 7.1. Uh, so uh, this is very close to the neutral, so we don't need to apply any lime or sulfur in this soil. Uh, so most of our vegetable crops, they grow very well in the pH range of about 6 to 6.5 five or up to 7. And if we look on the phosphorus content, that is, uh, is the excess amount, so we don't need to apply. And the potassium is also in the uh, uh, excess, so we don't need to apply any potassium. Calcium is in the medium range and magnesium is also high. And uh, if we look on the organic matter content, that is 4.1%, which is in the perfect range for the vegetable garden. So we don't need to apply any nitrogen, any phosphorus and any potassium, and we don't need to apply any lime uh, in the soil. So now let's talk, uh, let's talk briefly about, so how can we calculate the amount of fertilizer for the lawn, vegetable and the flower bed? So let me let me share uh, one uh, website here. Give me a second. Okay, Jennifer, can you see this uh, website here, this page? I can see the page, but the print is it's pretty fine print. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether I can increase that from somewhere. I put the link in the chat so folks can go there. Okay. And check okay. It out. So thank you. Yeah. So uh, we can uh, we can calculate the fertilizer uh, by uh, by ourselves as well by using the unitary method. Uh, we can change our garden square feet and uh, all those uh, all those math. But uh, we have uh, Yamu has developed a lawn fertilizer calculator and in which uh, we will get the amount of fertilizer we need to apply 
if we know the exact area of our land for the lawn or for the garden, and uh, if we know the nutrient content of the fertilizer. So the test report give us the amount of nutrient required to apply. So we, so, uh, we already uh, saw from those report, but that number is the amount, amount of nutrient we need to apply. So that was not the amount of fertilizer we need to apply. So that is the most important thing. Uh, we need to be we need to be careful. So we need to calculate how much fertilizer we need to apply to supply that much amount of nutrient from those fertilizer. So uh, for this, uh, we need to know how much of our lawn or garden uh, uh, garden area is uh, is uh, in the square feet. Then uh, we need to we need to calculate that. Then the second thing we need to know is how much is the nutrient content of that fertilizer we are going to apply in that soil. So if we know these two different parameters, then uh, we can uh, uh, we are able to calculate the actual amount of fertilizer we need to apply. So uh, because of the time limitation, uh, I don't go into much details on this calculator, but let's put a number of uh, of your of your garden. So if I put, let's say, uh, if I put the 2,000 square feet uh, for the garden area here, I did that here. Then uh, we enter the amount of nitrogen we wish to apply from that soil test report. So let's say uh, if we need to apply uh, one pound of nitrogen uh, for the lawn. So I put here one. Then uh, then uh, we also need to uh, put those. Uh, Nitrogen contain of the fertilizer. So let's take, uh, so let's take an example of the urea fertilizer, which contain 46% of nitrogen. So let me put here 46% here. Then if we click on this one, calculate pounds, uh, pounds required for that one, then this gives the number. So uh, for that 2,000 square feet of the lawn, if we need to apply one pound of nitrogen for 1,000 square feet. And if and uh, if we are going to apply the urea fertilizer for the lawn, so this is just an example. Uh, it contains 46% nitrogen. We need to apply 4.3 pounds of that urea fertilizer to cover our 2,000 square foot of our lawn. That means the rate is 2.2 pounds of that fertilizer. Uh, means that uh, urea fertilizer for uh, for 1,000 square feet, or uh, if we convert that to the pounds per acre, that is. 95 pounds of fertilizer per acre. So that's all I have. And uh, if you have any questions, please let's put in the chat box. All right, thank you, Druba. I'm now gonna turn it over to Kelly to talk about monarch migration. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Let me get this pulled up here. Okay, can you see that okay? Yes. Okay. So yeah, just really quickly, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, monarch uh, spring migration, which is underway now. And I also want to uh, talk a little bit about the overwintering site in Mexico, which I just visited in February. So let's talk a little bit about that. Okay, so I, whenever we talk about monarchs, we have to um, talk a little bit about the fact that their populations have been on the decline. And why is that? Well, they've had habitat loss. They've had habitat loss here in the United States. Um, they have had habitat loss in the overwintering um, area in Mexico. Use of pesticides, herbicides, mosquito controls, any of these chemicals that we use on our homes, on our farms, those are detrimental to not only monarchs but other um, pollinators as well. So we just need to be very mindful about those things when we use them because they have had a, they have had a devastating effect on monarchs in particular. Um, disease. Disease has certainly factored into their decline. Uh, changes in weather pattern. You know, monarch butterflies weigh about the same as a dime. And if you think about something that weighs the amount of a dime trying to fly through hurricanes and wildfires and things like that, you know, that's, that's not going to be a good ending. 
uh, the monarch butterfly is now on the endangered species list. It's actually on the, the uh, international endangered species list. So that is good news because now there's going to be funding and other resources to help to uh, save the population. So that is not a good thing, but it can help in some ways. So, overwintering in Mexico. So, most of you probably know that monarch butterflies do migrate to Mexico and they spend the winter there and then they migrate back north. And they roost in Oyamel fir forest, and that is a type of fir tree that lives at high elevations, 24 to 3600 meters, which is about two miles above the sea level. So they um, overwinter in these really dense forested areas, really high up in the mountains. And this is an ideal microclimate for the monarchs. The temperature is pretty stable. The humidity is at a good level to where they won't dry out. And we're still learning about how they find these forests in Mexico. I'll show you a map here in just a moment. But it's just absolutely amazing, not only that they can make it to Mexico, but that they could find these really specific areas in the forest. Okay, so um, I was able to visit two monarch sanctuaries when in Mexico. Uh, one is called El Rosario, and the other one is Sierra Chinqua, and these are both in the state of Michoacan, and you can see here from this travel advisory alert that this is a do not travel area for American tourists, but we did it anyway uh, because we wanted to see the monarchs, and it was absolutely incredible. But this is a very remote part of Mexico, and you can see here the, the National Guard, they're decked out and, you know, their guns and everything. Um, there is crime and, you know, American tourists getting kidnapped there. Um, because it is very, a very, very remote area. So this isn't, you know, just your typical tourist destination. This was quite an adventure to get there, uh, but definitely, definitely worth it. Okay, so the picture here on the left um, is me after I broke down and cried because of the, the fact that I was at the Monarch Sanctuary, which is a bucket list item for me. Uh, this was the entrance to El Rosario, which is the largest overwintering site in Mexico, and it contains about 80% of the world's monarch population. 80%. So that was absolutely incredible. So you get to the Monarch Sanctuary, you have to ride horseback about a mile and a half to two miles up a mountain, and then you have to hike another mile to get to the top of this mountain to see the Monarchs. Um, this is one of those things that pictures do not do justice, and I'm going to show you a very short video here in just a moment. Um, but the day that we were there, it was warm, it was sunny, the butterflies were flying around, and there were absolutely millions and millions of them, as you'll see in this video. So this was the second site that we went to, and they weren't flying around as actively at this particular site. This was a smaller site, and these are the fir trees here in the photos, and I don't know if you can see it or not, but these really dark areas, those are millions of monarchs clustered together on these trees. And their weight is such that the, the limbs will start to droop. And it's, like I said, the pictures don't do it justice. You can't hardly see what's going on here. But these are just clusters of millions of monarchs. Okay, let's see if we can get this going. There we go. Okay, so, um, make sure I've got it there. So now is the time when they are starting to migrate north. I've seen a few in my backyard in the last couple of weeks. So as the temperatures in Mexico start to warm, the days start to lengthen, that triggers the monarchs to start their northward migrations, which they are doing right now. So as they migrate north, they breed, they lay eggs on milkweed, and they just continue going north further and further. And... Um, 
unlike the generation before them, uh, this overwintering population does live for several months, but it does take several generations to make that final spring migration. So for instance, the ones that overwintered in Mexico, they're laying eggs, they're having babies, and the great great grandchildren of that overwintering population will be the ones that eventually make it back up into Canada. So we're very fortunate here in Missouri that we are on the monarch migration pathway, both fall and spring. So you can see here um, kind of some maps of that. So be on the lookout for these guys as you're working out in your gardens um, over the next few weeks. I'm, I'm hoping you'll be able to see them. And this is what the, the overwintering population looks like. So if you see a monarch butterfly in your backyard with very tattered wings, it's ones that have come from Mexico. These are the ones that have uh, had a rough, rough winter and a rough migration, but you know they, they do make it up here. So that's what you're seeing if you see one that looks like this. So how can you help? Well, how the same way we can help other pollinators. Have things in bloom all year long. Limit your use of chemicals. Um, remember dandelions and clover and some of the things that we consider lawn weeds are an important source of food for some of our pollinators. And of course milkweed. Everyone knows that milkweed is the uh, host plant for the monarch butterfly. So definitely plant lots of that. And I want to show you this quick video here. I know we're running out of time, but um, I hope this works. Jennifer, can you see this? Yes, yes. go ahead. Right. Yes. Absolutely millions of them. And I wish I could edit out this guy in the blue outfit here. because. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it was a warm, sunny day. Millions flying around. You can hear hummingbirds in there chirping. You can hear their wings flapping. It was just an absolutely magical experience. And if you ever get a chance to go, I highly recommend it. So, Jennifer, that's all I have. All right, thank you, Kelly. And we're gonna wrap up by sharing some upcoming events with you. And I'm gonna turn it over to Debbie to get that started. Yeah, I'm going to start here with some of, of the educational events that are upcoming, and then Kelly is going to come back with some of the Master Gardener plant sales. So just a few that are upcoming. If you're interested in growing tomatoes and want to actually start expanding and doing it for sale, the Missouri uh, 2023 Tomato School is upcoming Tuesday through Thursday, May 16, 17, and 18. You, in person in St. Louis. Or if you're not in the St. Louis area, you can join via Zoom. Um, the second, the first day, the 16th, it's all educational. Then the 17th will be farm tours in the St. Louis area. And then on the 18th, there will be farm tours in Central Missouri and in Southwest Missouri. And I'll drop a link for registration for that um, in the chat box here when I'm done. Tamara is doing a Become a Garden Steward. And that starts May 18th through June 15th. And I'm sure that uh, she will go ahead and drop a link into the chat box on how you can register for that. Katie Kamler uh, is doing the St. Genevieve Garden and Walk and Plant Sale that will be on Saturday and Sunday, May 20 and 21, hosted by the St. Genevieve Master Gardeners. And if there's a link, Katie, go ahead and drop that into the chat box. And then we have um, the annual Master Gardener State Conference. And this year, those of us that are horticulture specialists actually are putting the conference together. It will be September 30th and October 1st in Columbia. That's a Saturday, Sunday. And we'll provide you more information as that comes about, but mark that on your calendar. And then you can always go to our extension website at extension.missouri.edu. Click on the word events, and then you can type in anything that you want that you're looking for, and hopefully that event will actually be listed there. So I'll go ahead and stop and let Kelly show hers of what the Master Gardeners are doing. Kelly?
Kelly, you're muted. Okay, let's try that one more time here. Okay. Okay, so several plant sales. Um, I'll just go through these really quickly here. So Kansas City um, is having a plant sale on May the 20th. May the 20th at the Blue Springs Historical Museum. And these are not in date order. Um, so uh, St. Peter's, Missouri um, will be having um, a plant sale on April the 29th. And it looks like there's some details there. Um, so if you want more information on that, go to the St. Charles County Master Gardeners website. Looks like you may need to make a reservation to attend that one. Central Missouri Master Gardeners in Jefferson City will be having one on May 5th and 6th. Lots of good plants there. Uh, that will take place at 801 Sandstone Road in Jefferson City. Christian County Master Gardeners will be having one on May the 6th in Nixa. Master Gardeners of Greene County, we're having our big plant sale this Saturday at the Springfield Botanical Gardens, specifically at the Japanese um, Stroll Garden here, 8 a.m. until sold out. And then the Kirksville Master Gardeners will be having one on May the 13th from 7 a.m. to noon at the Kirksville Farmer's Market. And that's all I have. And I'll go ahead and close this out. We just want to say thank you very much for joining us. We greatly appreciate your questions every week. If you're interested in saving all of these links, you can go down into the chat box area. There are three dots there. Click on that. And those three bots, those three dots will actually, you'll be able to actually click on that and then save the chat and put it wherever you might like in your files and your, on your computer. And you can go to those at a later time. We'll be back next week with more questions and answers for you. And we hope to see you then. In the meantime, have a great week and happy gardening.